Jared McCaffrey, welcome to the podcast, man. I'm really excited to be here. Thanks for having me, Brett. <laughs> Mate, we have come full circle with our relationship here. We started this started you interviewing me, and now here we are. I'm interviewing you. This is fantastic. I know coach and, and journalist i like that you're still wearing that coach hat too i think that makes you really good at uh what you're doing here but yeah it is kind of funny how the <laughs> tables have turned a little bit <laughs> i can't ever let go of that and and it's probably a little bit of like you can't ever let go of the journalism too you know it's always going to be a part of who you are and i think in in order to stay fresh in your own mind it's good to um it's good to stay on that so i uh I guess I would say coaching for sure has that feel where it's like, I always want to do this. This is, this is fulfilling. I mean, this is the work. This is the stuff that, um, that really feeds me as far as relationships and in, you know, being able to develop those and stuff. I think coaching really gets a hold of you quickly and, uh, journalism too. I definitely enjoy talking the sport, um, and making sure that coaches like myself and yourself are, are able to, you know, have conversations that help other coaches. I think that's something that I learned as a journalist, how helpful that was based on the feedback that I got from people on deck and stuff. So, um, yeah, just, yeah, happy to participate on this side of it for this time. Well, mate, it's kind of, it was actually surprising when I heard you were going into full-time coaching. I was kind of shocked, actually, because you were the man. You were, you were the best at this. Like it was finally, we had someone in our sport who got us, who understood us, who could relate to us, who asked great questions, who was inquisitive, who uh, just seemed to be in the right place at the right time. Like for me, you were kind of a breath of fresh air in terms of journalism. It just wasn't these old, you know, journalists writing on a notepad. I mean, you were innovative. You were cutting up videos. You were doing things I mean, you and I kind of had the first real viral swimming video, you know, the, the yeah. Auburn, the Auburn puke set from back in the day. What was that? 2008 or nine, I think. Yeah. I think it was before the Olympics. Cause I mean, Caesar was a big name, but he wasn't an Olympic gold medalist yet. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He wouldn't have done that as an Olympic gold medalist. <laughs> I think we got him just in time. So it must've been, you're right. It was uh, right before the Olympics. So. Yeah, maybe right after NC2As in 2008 and yeah. then before the Olympics, right? Yeah, yeah, but you know what I mean? Like the, you, you were kind of the guy in journalism and, and you were doing some amazing things. So I kind of want to, I want to track the journey a little bit because there's obviously a story there somewhere. So we'll get into it. But in terms of just you uh, getting to know you a little bit, um, how did you get into the sport of swimming? Uh, my dad was a swimmer. And so I was doing summer league stuff from the time I was five or six. Uh, it was kind of always something that I took well to enjoy during the summer, you know, at certain points, I think in my maybe pre-teens, early teens, you know, I tried a couple year round uh, weeks <laughs> and it just, you no, know, it wasn't quite the same. It was a little more intense and just uh, I was still playing soccer, trying to play basketball, um, doing some other sports. So I kind of just put off that full-time swimming thing, but I definitely have been a swimmer since I was five or six. I just didn't start club swimming year round until the end of my junior year of high school. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that helped with my continued involvement in the sport because I just like understand it a little better than I would have if I was 11 and 12 and 13. So you know, I really developed my understanding of the sport as kind of a 17, 18 and now 38 year old still kind of developing it. But I feel like I got that that first uh, taste of it and, and like the higher level and what it took um, at a time when I was more ready for it. And I think it probably, you know, maybe cost me a little bit as far as how far I was able to get as a college swimmer in some ways, if I looked at it. Uh, but I wouldn't change any of it because it kind of kept swimming as part of my life. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's it's because it kind of still feels like unfinished business or I didn't get a chance to burn out, you know, early on. But uh, after I started, I uh, went to University of Washington for two years, um, was lucky enough to walk on, uh, was recruited as a sprint freestyler, transitioned into backstroke a little bit, uh, took a gap year in 2003, 2004 to try to see what I could do with my club coach at the time and then uh, transferred to University of Missouri for two years and finished up my eligibility and 
got my degree in broadcast journalism from the best broadcast journalism school in the country. So, um, I, uh, it, you know, I decided instead of doing the small town local sports and getting into those 15, 30 second bites with people that I would rather, um, get into a little bit more depth. And I just got lucky with, a, I, well, I can't, I, I got lucky with the people I knew and, mm. uh, the connections that I had made through swimming in the athletic department at yeah, university of Missouri and got connected with, uh, the Florianis who already started flow track and flow wrestling. Um, but it was still very new and very raw. And it was a, a concept that was, you know, nobody else had done and they wanted to start swimming and they basically helped me do that. And, uh, yeah, I just, that, that's where I got my crash course and coaching, swimming, everything. It was an experience that I, you know, look back on very fondly. Um, and I think it set me up for a lot of the other stuff. So I don't know, that kind of transitioned all the way into flow, but that was kind of my, uh, my background in swimming. Well, just in terms of journalism, when did that passion start? Because, you know, when, when you go into college, you don't always really know what you want to do. Like I, I was still trying to figure it out. There are certain people who say, yeah, I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be an engineer. And it's like, that's where I'm going. But um, did you know from a young age, what, why was it journalism in particular? I think I, I enjoyed uh, writing and speaking. And it was always something that, you know, I excelled more in English than math. Uh, I was, you know, better with, you know, that, that kind of work. Um, so I think you know, at University of Washington, I went into communications and I looked into journalism and what they would offer, but their journalism program didn't offer broadcast. Um, so I was just going to do communications. Uh, and I, I knew that I kind of wanted to get into broadcast from the time I went to school. Um, and I did an internship in that gap year at a local sports radio station. And I asked them, I was like, should I do a broadcast degree or a communication degree? And they said broadcast. So yeah, I think, uh, that's kind of where I it, it led. It was always kind of leading towards that with my education because nothing else as far as, um, you know, routes to education really appealed to me. I think, you know, if I, yeah, looking back on it, I, I, I would love to go back and get a little bit more, you know sports physiology or I think Sergio always recommended and I would take this very seriously when Sergio recommends something that if you're going to go back to school go to go for psychology versus physiology mm. so I would love to go back and, and do more of that stuff but that just wasn't the path that I was on at that point I guess that's what I did man I did the psychology and I'm, I'm so glad I did it was it was great in in that sense use it every day um still okay. trying to figure myself out too so uh, it's all good but in terms of um you know, when you're, when you're a swimmer, you kind of hope and dream to be an Olympic athlete. You hope that that's kind of where it takes you. In terms of the journalism itself, you talked about broadcasting. What, what did that mean for you? Like, where, where did you think or hope you would end up? In radio or on television or where was it? Yeah, I, uh, I definitely wanted to do the television route. Um, I wasn't necessarily in college limited to just swimming. Um, uh, so I, yeah, I guess I saw myself, I'd love to, I would have loved to be at ESPN for sure. I mean, that's everybody's dream, especially at that point, um, when they were still at their peak. Uh, so I, you know, I looked at that as a, a really cool place to be. I thought that that would be fun to talk sports. I knew from a very young age that I wanted sports to be part of my life. I love yeah. sports. I love part being part of it. I love the concept of it. Um, you know, and, and the, the strengths that you build from it. So I knew sports was going to be part of it broadcast ended up being the route that i did in college what other sports are you into other than swimming what are you what are you passionate about well i love my seattle seahawks um mm -hmm. i'm a big time nfl fan uh you know i like nba i love nba you know mm -hmm. I, I especially in the playoffs <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that i'm passionate you know as a uh seattle sports fan it's kind of tough but i still you know they they made us fall in love with basketball through the nineties. And then it was like, you know, stolen and broke our hearts in early two thousands. And then, <laughs> you know, still kind of a little bit scarred from that, but you know, I'm in Phoenix now for almost 10 years and the suns are looking pretty good. So I'm, I'm open to, <laughs> to taking on a new team. I like both of those sports. Cool. Now, the other thing you want when you graduate from college is you want, you want to make some money. You want to start paying off some debts or what have you, but you, you want to get some, some money in your bank account. How did this uh, flow swimming idea uh, translate into money for you at that time? Like it's, it's a great concept, but um, 
what did that mean in terms of putting money in your bank account? I mean, it was, it was enough to get by. It was, it, and when you're looking at, you know, starting broadcast jobs, it's not like you're looking to really start <laughs> putting money away from retirement at that point. It's mm-hmm. looking for survival. So flow was tough. I moved in with the two Floriani brothers into one house with the programmer. And for the first year, you know, slept on a mattress on the floor, but really didn't spend as much time there as you would think because I was on the road the whole time. So, uh, you know, that was the whole concept is that we were like swimming. It was delayed gratification for what was going to pay off in the end. And the the pay at that point was just enough to kind of get by. It included rent um, for for living, which was huge. And I mean, it, in concept, it sounds great that your bosses will pay for your living. But when you live with your bosses and everybody that you work with, it makes it pretty tough to have any kind of balance or hmm. any of that stuff. So it was a startup. And that's what you were supposed to do. You were all in it together. And it sucked, but it didn't matter. You were all in it together. And you're, you know, young. And I, you know, I was in my early 20s, they were in their late 20s. And it was just like, we were taking on the world. So it didn't really matter. You didn't slow down to think about that. I was just so into the um, the mission and so excited to be part of it and that I got the opportunity. I was, ma- I was making enough money to live. And at that point, the experience was kind of what I was going for. Um, yeah. And then at a certain point, it's like, okay, this experience is, is it was hard. I mean, it was, it was, I know a lot of people travel for work, but I wasn't just traveling for work. You were nice when you put me up at Auburn in a hotel. Most of the time I was on a couch or I was lucky enough to be in a guest bedroom and I was trying to put together trips, you know, from Austin. I drove up through, you know, uh, through all of the big 10 schools to Minneapolis, you know, on a three week trip. I did one from, you know, Austin through SEC land uh, down in uh, Louisiana, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, the Carolinas, and all the way up, um, uh, up the East coast. So it was, it was great, but I was driving, I was, you know, living out of my suitcase and I was, you know, doing, doing the startup thing that, uh, people love being in person with people and being able to get the content. You know, we were talking before this, how you would love to get off of zoom and be doing in-person interviews mm-hmm. and how much more conversational that could get. It was awesome. Yeah. wonderful and you got I, I feel like because i was presenting myself as like hey i'm just here can i stay on your couch like people were very friendly and like took care of me and like were giving me great content it was amazing content so you know it was, it was uh it wasn't about the money i guess to answer your question really yeah yeah and clearly yeah and 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 that's a, a great answer i really appreciate the insight uh, some of that stuff i didn't actually know but um in, in terms of the content itself, what were you looking for? Uh, what, what did you feel like was great content and uh, how were you going to get it? The workout videos were great. Um, you know, workout videos were the ones that everybody really seemed to enjoy. Um, it was just it was and- stuff that people hadn't seen before, right? Like you, you, it was the internet was relatively new in that stage, you know, sharing of information at that speed was relatively new too. So the content, the workout videos themselves, people are always into workouts for some reason. They're still into it. Like, oh, Brett, tell us a workout. Like, you know, but to me, it's kind of like, wow, but, but everybody just eats it up. And that it seemed like that content especially was getting eaten up at the time, right? Yeah. 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 It was, uh, I, I think that was a big piece of the whole flow swimming. I'd love to say that it was my journalistic skills and stuff. And I really appreciated you kind of alluding to how like, you know, that was it, but it was, it was just very, very fortunate that it all came together at that time. Cause you're right. It was a thirsty market. They were mm. so hungry for anything. Um, and I think that's where it, yeah, it really took off and really was so well received. I think now, like you said, on Instagram, you can see what people are doing. Like putting power towers on a video was just, nobody had ever just, you know, done that or, mm. you know, like putting music to it. People have, people do it like all the time now on Instagram and you can really follow and see what, you know, a lot of programs are doing consistently, not just a glimpse at once. You can see what they're doing pretty regularly. Yeah, man, it's really evolved. Um, but a lot of inspiration has been drawn from what you did, man. And uh, it was groundbreaking at the time. There's actually a little story behind the um, the Gatorade set video. Uh, you were at another program. Tell me your side of the story in terms of how it evolved that day. I think that was one of my trips just through the SEC where I was trying to stop at any spot that I knew a swimmer that I could stay on their couch or a coach that I could stay on their couch. 
And I think you saw a video from me at Florida or something. Where was yeah. I? Well, I actually got a I got a phone call from you or a text message maybe at the time, and you were like, "Hey, Brad, can I come up? I just got kicked off the deck at Florida." For for this is my perspective. So uh, apparently, Greg Troy wasn't super happy that you were there. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I do remember this. <laughs> yeah, I guess Greg, because yeah, I went to um, to Gainesville to get some content, and one of his swimmers, and you know, I <laughs> I used whatever connection I had. I don't know if it was a good connection, so I don't know <laughs> if that was the introduction I needed, but. He was not interested in having me on deck and I needed some place to go and, and fill the content. And uh, yeah, you were you you picked up on what flow swimming could be for recruiting and what mm -hmm. like it could mean for a program to have that kind of exposure very early on. And I think that fuels a lot of the Instagram um, yeah. content and maybe even the workout stuff, because even though it wasn't necessarily a real workout, you know, it was like everybody tuned in to see that because you can't <laughs> can't see that one on paper <laughs> <laughs> well my backstory behind the the way we came up with the set was i got this text message from you saying hey i got kicked off the deck at florida can i drive up there and, and do a workout when, when are you guys working out this afternoon i was like uh you know two o'clock or whatever we can we can make it work whenever you get here and you were kind of doing the math and you're like all right i think i can make it work let's 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 shoot for four hours from now i was like all right great so then i get on my on my phone and i text um the pro guys you know i, I text caesar cielo and uh, i think uh, brian lundquist was on the video as well alexi, um, alexi james white yeah so yeah. I, I text them i'm like hey guys um garrett from flow swimming is coming up what's the dumbest thing we can come up with for a workout? <laughs> because my reasoning behind that was, um, you know, everyone's always asking for workouts. And to me, it was like, it was like one workout is not going to change, you know, the course of your, your season, you know, figuring out, Oh, so, and, but people were always like, what are you doing? I want to do that. What are you doing? I want to do that. And, and to me, it wasn't just one concept. And so I was like, why don't we put out the dumbest concept and see how many dumb people pick up on that concept and put it into their program. And I, and I thought maybe three or four people might, might look at it and be like, oh, that's cool. Um, but, you know, little did I know this thing kind of blew up and I didn't, I didn't know how it was going to evolve at the time. And I think, I think even before you had started filming you, while you're on the deck, we were trying to figure out exactly how we were going to do this thing. And I think it changed during the workout. Like, all right, let's, let's do this way. It might be better to, to film it this way and stuff like that. So it was just, it was kind of one of those workouts where I was like, this is so stupid. I, I think, uh, yeah, we realized they couldn't do hundreds anymore. <laughs> they were done. <laughs> they were like, yeah, it's got to go 50. And now That's it's right. just, all right, how can we make everybody puke as quick as possible? Because we got to finish the video. Yeah, I think right. it was good for swimming, and I got a lot of crap about it, and I'm sure you got a lot of crap about it. And yeah. obviously, you don't want to ever put your swimmers. I know I am in no way recommending it, and I know no. you wouldn't either. No. But as far as putting swimming kind of like and uniting swimmers in something like, I don't know. I thought it was. I, I don't have any problem with it. Looking back, obviously, I would never recreate it or anything, um, yeah. and I don't think you could get away with it now. But I, I will defend that it was good for the sport at the time. Yeah, I was lucky that I had I had Richard Quick as the head coach. I was an assistant at the time, and I and I just did it with the pro athletes, and I said, "Hey guys, what do you guys want to do?" So I kind of left it in their hands, and they we created it together. It wasn't like my decision said you have to do this, and I certainly wouldn't want athletes to do it again looking back on it i'm like i was i was stupid you know you do some dumb stuff in your life but at the same time it was funny but um but yeah it was just one of those videos that kind of latched on to people and, and blew up it was pretty awesome in that sense but moving on from that um that that's kind of the the progression of the some of the good times and some of the content you were getting it seemed like things were moving in, in a great way uh when when did it take a turn for the the worse like what happened at flow swimming um i think uh i think it was more than journalism and trying to figure out how to make money off of it and the pressure of trying to figure out how to get the good content and make money off of it and uh you know, we did some, we did some stuff like the, I think we did Hawk Talk. Remember that one where yeah. I came out and we did a couple mm. series and, um, you know, we were lucky enough to get a little sponsorship for that. Thank you, Keith. You're the man. But, um, it was, it, it, it was, it was hard. It was really hard. And, uh, living in the house, 
where, you know, you come home from a road trip of three weeks living on couches and you come home to your, your coworkers. It was, it was a hard, it, like you said, in your twenties, you could <laughs> do a lot of things, but you also did a lot of dumb things. Like it was hard to like make all of that work. Sure. Um, and mm -hmm. I just think in, in hindsight, of course it was like that. Why don't you just change your settings and, and make it work? But it was hard to, to realize that in your twenties. And um, so it came to a head when I essentially secured a, uh, a deal that I didn't get approval from um, to cover my trip to, I think world championships in 2009. And um you know, my failure as a salesman, uh, I think was the reason that, yeah, it kind of, it kind of came apart a little bit. Like that was, it was, it was, uh, it, yeah, it was, it was a different role than what I thought I'd signed up for. I signed up to be, you know, the storyteller. Um, and I, as a startup, you have to be more than that. And you, you do, you have to be, uh, wear a bunch of hats. And, you know, I think I, I adapted the quickest I could, but it's just, I think the pressure of trying to figure out how to monetize it um, became the biggest obstacle that ended up leading to, you know, close to me and I parting ways. Did it end a little ugly in the end? I mean, do you guys still talk or is it, you know, we've reached out and I think we're good now. I have, I mean, they've continued and I mean, they have a multi-million dollar company with flow sports now. So they've wow. obviously moved on and, they don't have swimming hold anymore. I don't think, I mean, Clark Burkle came back and did a great job for a while with that, but you know, I don't think that that's still being fed any new content. They still have, I think 20 other sites, 30 other sites, they're big into live video and they've, I mean, they've made their dream evolve and you know, they've pivoted when they've needed to and been, you know, great entrepreneurs and, and, you know, made it into a, a successful business. Um, so we don't have any hard feelings. There was no like huge incident. I think that's as, open as I could be. That was, that was the straw that broke the camel's back, I guess, where we were just feeling that pressure and me committing to a deal that they were not satisfied with was it. Yeah. Fair <laughs> that, enough. that was as, you know, from, from my perspective, that was, that was it. And we've, we've talked since I've talked to with Mark a couple of times. So as far as I know, it's cordial and, and we're on good terms. Good man. Yeah. You, you grow past things eventually, you, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter what happens in the past with any relationships. You can, you can kind of put those aside in the end. And, uh, we all, we all get too old for arguments, you know, but, um, w where'd you go from there after flow swimming? What was next? Swimming world, which, you know, was a journalistic entity, the most, you know, uh, solidified journalistic entity that we have, right? Swimming World Magazine. I don't think anything that you can think of goes further back in swimming media than that. So, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, obviously I had a little bit of a relationship with uh, Brent and some of the Swimming World guys uh, beforehand. So, you yeah, know, that's when I moved to Phoenix and, um, and started working for Swimming World. Nice, nice. And was that uh, a good experience? How long did that experience last? About a year and a half. Okay. Yeah. About a year and a half, about 18 months. Um, you know, I would made it pretty clear to, uh, I didn't, I didn't really understand exactly what had happened at uh, flow at the time. I think I just was knew I was burnt from traveling yeah. and covering stuff and like, then all of a sudden not having, you know, a job. So I, you know, I was telling Brent, I'm like, I can't, I don't want to just be on the road all the time anymore. And putting everything into this if you know, <laughs> that it, look where it left me so um I, you know he said he understood that um and for the most part he respected that but i was uh, producing the morning swim show for peter bush which was mm -hmm. wonderful peter bush is awesome dude and you know it was great to have a news anchor that i could work with and uh and it, it was great that part of it was good uh i, I was thirsty for a little bit more on-air experience I kind of felt like I was there to kind of take over the the video content and that was not what Brent brought me in there to do he kind of wanted me to do meet things and again sales so yeah. like <laughs> and I ended up doing all right not only do I go and produce the meat I have to sell you know I want you to buy the meat from us and I need you to buy magazines from us too <laughs> and like that was what I had to do and yeah. that was what I was being pushed into and I just the more I tried to do the swimming journalism thing, the more I realized you can't just do the swimming journalism thing, mm. you know, and trying to figure out how you monetize the swimming journalism thing. It's still a little bit of a mystery to this day. I think, you know, M Mel's got it somewhat figured out and, 
and uh, swim swam seems to be you know doing pretty well but it's at the time it was still very hard and they were transitioning from magazine as the golden goose into yeah. video content and online content and it was uh it wasn't the right fit at the time. I mean, Brent still swims for Phoenix Swim Club, and we have a good relationship as well. Um, so, yeah, it was a it was a rough little stretch there for a couple of years. <laughs> well, it, may, it makes us, you know, you you learn from the tough stretches. You know, you don't learn from the easy stuff necessarily. It's those tough ones that kind of turn you into the the diamond, right? But uh, when oh, did yeah. when did the 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 big one come along when did this whole i don't know if people everybody knows this but you're a co-founder of swim swam so when did how did this come about when did it happen well i had started coaching and you know i said from the second i graduated i had a, a swim coach at missouri who was a broadcast journalism major who was the assistant coach at missouri um and i said to him when i grew up he um myself getting into coaching again and so when Swimming world uh, ended. I ended up getting on the deck, and I was at Phoenix Swim Club in the fall of 2011, and I got a call from Mel, you know, like, hey, dude. So I got a, uh, a call from Mel um, when I was coaching early on in my coaching at, at Phoenix Swim Club, and he was interested in um, – talking about possibly starting up another website and starting up something that, uh, you know, would, would he keeps trying to call me. And I think it's my son's results, but hopefully that's it. And they'll stop trying to call. It's all good, man. Um, so you get the phone call from Mel. So, and uh, yeah, we ended up talking and we discussed at the time, you know, who else we would need to drive content. Cause what you had at, at Flow was video content. What you had at Swimming World was the written content that was just, at that time, Jason Marsteller's relentlessness of just, you know, posting everything. And uh, if we wanted to combine the two, there was somebody out there, Braden Keith, who was doing something similar. Um, I am, for some reason, and I'm sorry, Braden, forgetting what the website was at the time, but he was crushing it with just consistent news stories and I was like, Mel, you got to check this guy out. He's really good. And uh, we kind of brought Braden in and and, and start. He was interested. And um, obviously that has taken off and he has become, I think, big. Three. So, yeah. And we got Braden um, to, to come in and, and on board. And it was heading into an Olympic year. And so we took the momentum from – NC2As that spring and then carried it through Olympic trials. And then, you know, by the Olympics uh, in 2012, we were, uh, I don't know, we were a presence for sure. On the business uh, side of things, just uh, kind of explain that to me a little bit. How did you guys decide how to break this thing up? If you're bringing people into this new startup, this new company, how you don't have to give me exact details, but I'm just trying to understand what was the breakup with all that? There was an opportunity for investment and, uh, you know, Mel was the primary one, Mel and Tiffany, uh, uh, Mel's wife were the, the primary investors who brought it all in and you could invest your money or your time. And I was into investing my time for some uh, ownership and for the first year and a half or so, uh, that was my contribution. And we did get paid a little bit, but, you know, it was a part-time job and I knew that coming on and I wouldn't have been able to take it on without having a coaching job as well. Um, but it, it worked Again, it wasn't necessarily about the short-term benefit. The idea was that there would be some, some long-term benefit there with some ownership. Um, and hopefully still there will be. And, and so where is it now? Where are you at with it uh, many years later? Well, what happened as, you know, I started to get further and further down the coaching road and, you know, things evolved at Phoenix Swim Club, I ended up taking on the head coaching role and I just had to be honest with Mel and Braden and Tiffany and just say, you know, I, I can't give this my honest effort and this my honest effort. So I need to take a step back. And, you know, I tried to keep um, a little bit of content flowing for a while and it just became too hard. So uh, they were great at honoring time that I had already put in and wonderful. It's still very minimal, which is fine. I'm, I'm not any kind of... <laughs> significant shareholder in swim swam but as a founding owner it's really nice to know that you know 
there's a little bit of investment there. Um, I haven't been contributing for probably six years or so beyond just, you know, sourcing when I hear of news or anything like that, that people want uh, to kind of pass along. Um, but I, you know, I still am regularly talking with Mel and, you know, anytime things come up and I would love to be able to do things at trials and, and any of those events if I'm needed. Uh, so the, the role is still open, you know, but it's, it's not anything that's active. I, I guess I would say at this point. And as far as, you know, how funding works, I mean, you saw Swim Swam you know, started up a magazine as well, because there's this market has been so ingrained for those print ads that they all understand what that print, you know, sales mean. And mm. I thought they did a pretty good job putting together a visually pleasant magazine that really was kind of cool. I think they've done a fantastic job. Yeah, it's actually a beautiful magazine. Who who runs that uh, side of things? Well, I, I mean, Mel has started up that whole other side, and I have zero <laughs> to do with it and zero knowledge of who exactly is in charge of it. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm founder. I, I love. I'm proud of of uh, how far it's come and most of the content that that goes up on it. Uh, but yeah, I I do not have very much of an active role going on. This uh, I was actually going to say that in terms of um, the the direction and, and what goes up and and how they're doing things. Do you have any say? And 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 if you don't, are you are you happy to still be associated as a co-founder? Is there a time? What I'm trying to say is that is there times where you're like, I just really disagree with the direction this is going. Yeah, yeah. When I see coaches that I know. Um, you know, being commented on or categorized in an unfair way. It's very hard. But I started that. I mean, Flow Swimming was the first place that those comments came up. And I remember Mike Bottom telling me, it's like somebody writing your name on the bathroom wall, but everybody can see it. You know, you know, like it's just, it was a different concept at the time. And I think that's a big piece of why journalism is so different. I mean, it's, it's not journalism anymore. It's like everybody has a microphone. Everybody has an opinion. Um, and I think Swim Swam it, it doesn't pretend to be more than that. I think Swim Swam is pretty open about, hey, we're going to get this information out to you as quick as we possibly can. I, I think we try hard not to put out false information and verify sources. And, you know, I think that there's been times when people question what's put up there. But for the most part, it's usually either corrected or it was right. So, it's, it's hard. It's really hard to see some of that stuff. And I think Braden does a good job of, for the most part, keeping, you know, impartial. And Braden's not the only one who makes those decisions. Um, he's definitely the one that I forward everything along to. And um, I think it, it falls on him to make the decisions. And, and I think he usually has sound reasoning behind most of the decisions that he's making as far as editorial decisions. So, uh it's tricky. It's just a different world. It's not the journalism that I went to school for. It's mm. just not, it's not a channel that people tune into. It's a clip that people might click through to watch the rest of. And it's a headline that again, people will either take as a fact and scroll on, or maybe possibly, you know, it with some interest, click on and, you know, read the quote that they were looking for from it. So it's, I don't, I don't feel like, I do get sometimes questions like people know, think that I know everything that's up on Swim Swam, <laughs> like yeah. oh, this article on this day or this article on that day. I'm like, I'm sorry. Like, I don't know what you're referencing. So sometimes I guess there's going to be some misconstrued perceptions on what my role is with them. And, you know, there might be some coaches that I have indirectly alienated because of that, but I, it's the ones that care to ask or the ones that, you know, I guess really matter. Hopefully they would ask. Um, before they assume that, you know, I had anything to do with that. And for the most part, I think people understand that, I, you know, I'm not the day-to-day -day guy that's in charge of any of that content. So Yeah, I fair enough. Well, at least if they're listening to this, we cleared it up for them. So that's good. <laughs> um, now, in terms of your, your dreams to be a journalist, I would think that starting up a, a business like this and the success that it's having – would draw you closer into that side of things. Why did you decide to go further away and back into the swim coaching side and just be a regular Joe like me? I mean, if you have the skills you have, I would go that direction. Don't come back this direction. What do you think? I, like I said, it's not, it's not the same journalism I went to school for, you know, it's not the same. And, um, 
I'd rather be part of creating some stories at this point. And uh, I, I really do feel that with coaching. Like it is such a powerful position to, to be in for someone if they need it and when they need it. And in a stage in their, in through a medium that, you know, I've got more expertise in swimming than I do journalism in my, I mean, I've spent more years in swimming than sure. journal. So, you know, I feel like, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to figure it out too, but I feel like the fulfillment of helping people and the purpose of helping people is more directly in coaching than in journalism. That being said, you know, I, I talk with Mel about ways that we could possibly get, you know, me back involved with content sometimes. Um, and, you know, it's a it's a busy time, uh, but it's not going to come at the cost of, of my of my coaching right now. That is that's just a commitment that I've made to, you know, my club and my my athletes at this point. And it's something that, you know, has helped me build a life for my family because it's been, you know, stable and, and a part of the 10 years that I've been able to you know, build a family here. And so, uh, you know, at this point it's, I don't think I'd necessarily close it off, but you know, there's a couple, this is not the purpose of it, but I don't feel like I'm necessarily getting farther away from swimming journalism. I'm definitely getting more niche into journalism or into mm -hmm. swimming, sorry, if I want to go into journalism, but I'm not necessarily getting too far away from it. If I do, you know, at some point get an opportunity to put something together, then I, I think I'm, more experienced for it because of my coaching experience. I will be able to reach athletes and coaches and understand the swimming community better for having, a, you know, really dove into this side of it. And, and it's not for that purpose because I really do enjoy it. Like that's why I'm still in it. It's because like you said, I will always be in coaching to some degree from now on. Like it will always be part of my life in some fashion from this point on. Um, but I do think too, like, you know, I don't think my bottom line as a color commentator can be big 12 finalist, <laughs> big 12 finalist in the hundred backstroke, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but got his butt kicked by all the Texas and Texas A&M guys, you know, like that doesn't really, you know, lend itself. You know, you got Olympian, you know, Rowdy's got gold medalist and Mel's got gold medalist and, you know, what's my expertise if I'm not a journalist, which maybe that's the angle too, but you know, I think, and I don't need to be an Olympic coach even, and I don't really care to be. And I think my college coach, my college swimming experience is enough um, to be able to do good color commentary and, and same with my coaching experience. But my point is more so that that experience lends me to hopefully providing even better perspective when I, and if I do get into that. I was going to say that. Do you have goals as a coach personally? Like, do you, do you strive to achieve anything particular in coaching See, that's the tricky part i'm kind of going through this weird like well it's not weird and i've always said it to my coaches but i'm really trying to embrace it more than ever coaching isn't about your goals right it, it's yep. not about about kids goals and so trying to come in with my goals i think a lot of coaches build this is going to be my analogy they build a castle mm -hmm. And they say, look at my castle and look at this tower. This is what I did with this pe this kid. And this is what I did with this person. And this is all the things that I've done. Come to my castle. I'm going to go out and meet the kids where they're at. And then we're going to get on that path. And I'm going to say, hey, you know, I think probably you should go this direction. And I think I can help you if you go in this direction. Or if you want to choose this direction, I can give you some advice if you go this way. But there you go. It's your path. It's well, I got to be honest with you. I, I got I got caught up in the castle building as a as a college coach because it's so competitive and everybody's out there selling their programs, and and you're all fighting over ten athletes. And you're launching catapults to the other castles uh -huh. and trying and their tower, saying they that's not even that good or this it. And I've been guilty too of talking shit about other coaches, and that's not healthy for any of us. A uh -huh. It, I mean, it's, it's an insecurity, right? It's like your way of like, eh, well, I am the best. Like I am, I do have the information, but ultimately we don't know exactly what's best for that kid. You know, we're willing to try and our experience could help, but like, you know, instead of spending time saying, you know, I, 
right, you're not alone. And I'm not, like I said, this is, you know, a path. So I'm not saying that I haven't said, well, you know, race pace training versus volume training and kind of done the same kind of thing. And that's, it's, it doesn't matter what, you know, what other people have, I guess I just don't like when you have to put down other people in order to build up yourself. And the whole concept of building up yourself is kind of not what coaching is all about. Which is the part of Swim Swam that I don't love personally. It's like we're slinging shit at each other online, you know? And and to me, it was it was, it was detrimental uh, at points. I, I see coaches get on there and I talk to coaches about the things they, the comments they read or the articles that are misquoted or misconstrued or one-sided or, um, you know, it, to me, it seemed to be like we were attacking the profession. We we're attacking each other publicly where we should be uplifting each other and supporting each other, which is Part of the reason, honestly, you know, there's many reasons why I decided to do this podcast, but part of the reason is I wanted to share great stories of great people and I wanted to uplift them. I wanted to tell people how great this person is, you know, and, and I love these stories. I love listening to you speak. Uh, I, I love all the stories on here. And, and, and to me, it's not about tearing each other down. It's about building each other up. And, and I'm really glad you you said it's, you know, your goals don't really matter. It's not about you. It's about the athletes because ultimately it really is. That's what coaching should be. It should just be about um, getting the best out of and nurturing these, these athletes to be the best they could possibly be. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think you could really get into a whole deep conversation on that coaching and like, you know, the different levels of manipulation that we use and, mm -hmm. Well, and there's good ways mm -hmm. of it. Like, yeah, I mean, manipulation is bad connotation, but coaching mm -hmm. it kind of, I tell my athletes all the time, I'm tricking you into working hard. I'm mm -hmm. up, up, but I'm tricking you into working hard, but it's a weird line where that can cross, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, what can you share with us uh, as, as a coach, some, some of the difficulties for you personally as a coach or some of the challenges or some of the successes, maybe even some, some ways where you felt really accomplished. Okay. Uh, well, tell me this. So here's one for you. You've got a family in the background, your wife's back there. You got kids back there. One of the toughest challenges for uh, any swim coach is balancing family. Right? So what's your take on balancing family? Um, I, it's a priority. It's got to be my top priority, um, because that's the the foundation. And I think it's it's very healthy to have something. It doesn't have to be family, but something other than just the sport. Um, and I think a lot of coaches can can get you know pretty wrapped up, and it. it just becomes you know one sided, and that's where you know I think mental issues come, and I think it it just gets tricky, you know, when you don't have the balance. And I've just found a similar fulfillment. Yeah, as, there's, there's one back there right now. Yeah, he uh, he bug his mom. <laughs> uh, but you know, I, I I think I just have to make it a priority, and I don't have. I, I give a lot to the club. I coach two groups. So I coach a master's group and our top senior group along with another coach. And, um, you know, that's being on deck for at least four hours a day, you know, every day. So it's it, on top of the time you take prepping for that and the time you're spending, you know, we do a lot of other things. So, you know, it's, it, it's tough sometimes to leave the deck at five and say you know i got these other coaches who are going to be here till seven but i i got to be okay with that and i got to be okay that some days i'm you know i'm going to be able to say hey can you take the group for today because i just i i got to take care of you know my sick kid today and having a support system at the at the club and a coach coaching staff who's got each other's back to be able to cover that is huge and i just i think the kids should know too it's to miss a day if you have something going on you're not gonna miss the olympics because you missed a day to go take care of something else in your life and i think a lot of our struggles as a sport right now are the pros who don't know how to transition into anything else in their life it's just all swimming and so i think having a balance is not only good for me mentally and right now it's a challenge a family is very hard right now like the example is that my son is home 
because he has a runny nose and they don't take him at school, which is another risk. Uh, but, you know, they both the runny nose. So on Monday, he got COVID tested. Um, two days ago, he got COVID tested. And we just now about, uh, you know, five minutes ago, got the negative test. But this has been two and a half days of daycare um, that we've had to kind of balance with, you know, my coaching responsibilities at the pool. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously my wife is working from home during the pandemic. So it creates stress because then I got to call my coaches during a pandemic and ask them to cover more, Uh uh, which puts more pressure on that. So I guess my answer is, is, is just ask for help. Like it's okay to Mm -hmm. ask and like, you're not going to do it all yourself. And we Mm -hmm. all as coaches have to be, you know, perfect to, you know, set the example. And I think vulnerability is a good example to set and asking for help and telling people, that life is effing hard right now is okay because everybody can kind of relate to that. So my balance isn't perfect. I listened to a podcast once that I really think helped. I don't think there is such thing as balance. There's only guilt and you can constantly feel guilty for being one place and not the other. I could feel awful right now for being here talking to you instead of taking care of my sick kid or being at the pool, taking care of the long list of things that you know, I have to do, but I really like talking swimming with you, bud. So I'm okay with that, you know? Well, I appreciate that. Well, listen, he's going to look back on this video in 10 years and, and see his dad saying that he feels guilty that he's here talking to me. And he's going to, he's going to, he's going to like that, you know, like, oh, dad, you know, so this is forever. So, but no, listen, I appreciate your time. It's very valuable and, and it means a lot to me. Um, I love chatting with you too. It's been too long, by the way. Uh, but listen, is there any, thoughts of uh, i mean are you happy being a club coach or is there thoughts of maybe college coaching or any any type of other coaching or is it club for you right now yeah club for me right now for sure i mean i don't think it gets better than phoenix swim club with a 50 meter tank and mm. six warm up warm down in paradise valley where it was 80 yesterday in december mm. <laughs> you know it is two miles from my house. So I live in a pretty nice little radius that I, you know, I could ride my bike in December to, to the pool, which is wonderful. You know, like I've got a very, very wonderful life here. Um, Dude, it does not get any better. Stay there as long as you can. <laughs> I will. Me And as long as I feel like I'm helping the program and we can continue to progress um, and get better tomorrow, I am, I'm happy to be. And I think it's an interesting question though, because you get it a lot as a club coach. Mm-hmm. Uh, to be honest with you, club coaches coach more, but don't tell the college coaches because I, I like coaching. And as a club coach, I get to coach. Club and coaches as- coach way more than college oh. coaches. I can tell you that. Jeez. Right. So, uh, I'm just way saying, more. We're restricted more. to 20 hours. That's it. I, I, I've i told you about my woes with sales. Like, I'm not very great. I mean, I think I'd, I'd, I'd love talking to college. Uh, to I talk to high school kids every day, so I think I could do that. And I think... I'm not closing any doors to what options are, but you know, I making it about the, the the swimmers really makes me a little bit more satisfied and uh, fulfilled doing it with the high school kids. You make a big impact and Mm. college kids, those kids have had success wherever they were, they were good. And if not the best, wherever they were. So they come in with a pretty, either fixed idea or good idea of what makes them good. So their openness to, you know, change is a little less than a 14 to 18 year old who has been coming up through your program and wanted to be in your group for a long time. And then you get three, you know, two to four years with them. You know, that's a lot more impactful um, in some ways. In some ways, there's also my argument, which was I was an 18 year old who got into swimming and those were my more formidable years. So I don't know. It's all about perspective, perspective on where you're at. And I'm very grateful for where I'm at right now. Awesome, man. Well, listen, um, there are certain people that come into your life that you're very thankful that they did. And you're one of them for me, man. You are, you are always, um, uh, good to me and you you did a lot for me and I I don't know if I've ever thanked you for it. Uh, I just enjoyed our time together and you're a good man. I think very highly of you and I'm, I'm glad you're happy and, and got a great family going on there, man. I'm very happy for you. That means a lot to me. Definitely feel the same about you, Brett. And, uh, dude, I'm all about this podcast. Keep them coming because you are doing great stuff. And it is because I, I gravitate towards that same thing you're trying to bring to it, you know, that positive piece. And so doing it. Thank you.
got some good ones coming in the future, man. And you're, you're one of them. So I appreciate your time. Uh, get back to the family and uh, get them healthy. All right. Thanks, Brett. See you, mate.